Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. A couple of videos ago I introduced you to my Compaq 486 where I added a Novell Netware networking card. Now in this video I'm going to be adding some sound with this Creative Sound Blaster 16 sound card. And this is not just any sound card because this is a Sound Blaster 16 with advanced signal processing. More on that later. Now I have the box as well and I thought it might be nice to see how this sound card would uh, pair up with this Compaq 486 and play some games with it. But first let's take a look at the card. So as I said earlier, this is a Sound Blaster 16, a CT2290. It is in fact a Sound Blaster 16 Pro. Now this is one of those old school sound cards that you configure using jumpers, so no plug and play here. Now there's lots of stuff to configure on this card because we have two IDE connectors here. There are various jumper settings here that allow us to set up the IDE addresses for the CD-ROM drives. We have jumpers here which set up the IO addresses for the IDE ports. We can set up the IRQs. We have jumpers here to enable or disable the MPU or the MIDI processing unit and set up its base address. We can enable or disable that special chip that I mentioned, the Advanced Signal Processor or ASP, later dubbed CSP, Creative Signal Processor. We've also got some jumpers here which are factory configured, so we shouldn't be altering those. We have a jumper for the PC speaker, so we can actually hook up our PC speaker onto this card as well. Regarding the chips, we have the CT1741 here, which is the DSP chip with a famous hanging note bug. Next to the advanced signal processor, we have our mixer chip, allowing us to mix 32 levels of uh, volume controls, both on the left and the right channel. And last, but definitely not least, we have this CT1747 chip with the OPL branding stamped on it. And this is in fact a chip from Creative which has integrated the Yamaha 262 OPL chip into its own chip. We've also got the CD audio input jacks which we're not going to be using here and we have the wavetable header. This is a 16-bit ISA card so it will slot in nicely into our Compaq 486. So let's get the card in there and install the drivers and get everything up and running. Now normally this should all go very smoothly as Creative is known for its very excellent uh, driver support so I'm not expecting a whole lot of issues here. And here we can see the Sound Blaster just beneath the networking card with its joystick port and the various audio jacks for speakers and microphone line in. In terms of speakers, I have these nice little Cambridge Soundworks uh, speakers that I picked up at a thrift store locally here for uh, three euros, which I thought was a pretty good deal. I like the aesthetic of these small uh, little speakers here. And it was only later that I actually found out that these were actually creative SBS 35 speakers designed by Cambridge uh, Soundworks. So for this video, I thought it would be interesting to boot up the machine with my Sound Blaster 16 and kind of go through the ABC of MS-DOS gaming for this period, showing you some cool MS-DOS games in alphabetical order. But before we can do that, we first need to install the drivers. So let's go ahead and do that. Now Creative is known for its excellent driver support, so I'm not expecting a whole lot of issues here. As we launch the first setup utility from the first disk, we are greeted with a welcome screen. We can continue and it will present us with some options where to install the drivers and it will also do an analysis of the sound card itself and propose the IO settings, the IRQs and the DMAs. After that it will start copying some files to the hard drive both for MS-DOS but also for Windows. We get a nice little summary of what has changed in our autoexec.bat file and config.sys. It will go ahead and copy some files for Windows as well. It will analyze the various Windows configuration files. And once everything is done, normally we should have a fully functioning computer with our Creative Sound Blaster 16 card. So now it's simply a matter of rebooting our machine, making sure there aren't any errors on startup. We got a utility here allowing us to test the sound card. Everything appears to be looking good. 
16-bit testing. That sounds good enough for me. So we can also launch Windows to see if the creative drivers are installed there. Normally we should hear a startup sound. And indeed we do, so everything appears to be installed correctly. Okay, time to play some games and we'll do this in alphabetical order. So we'll start with the letter A and start with Alien Breed from Team 17 published by Micro League for MS-DOS. Inspired by the Alien movie franchise, it gained very popular uh, reviews for the Amiga, but less so for uh, MS-DOS. I also wasn't able to get it up and running completely on my machine, as there was a lot of screen corruption, as you can see here. Now, I tried fixing this because this computer has a Tseng video card, and there is a Tseng video mode that you can enable on this game, but as I was doing that, it got even worse. There were artifacts all over the place, so that was definitely not a solution. I also had some issues with the sound so I tried configuring the sound but then all of a sudden my computer would lock up as soon as I tried to configure stuff like uh, IO addresses IRQ. Something that was pretty common back in the day that you know, stuff would hang all of a sudden as you were configuring uh, hardware. So let's try another game with the letter A. Alien Carnage coming in at 3.6 megabytes. Developed by Interactive Binary Solutions and published by Apogee. It is a cartoonish style game featuring a character called Halloween Harry. With different weapons at his disposal, he goes off to save the world and save damsels in distress and kill all the aliens that he encounters. So yeah, pretty, pretty nice little game here, platform shooter. Now moving on to the letter B with Bram Stoker's Dracula, developed and published by Psychosis. Now this game had a little issue here because it was unable to detect any EMS memory, which is correct because in my config.sys I had my memory manager set to no EMS. So certain games require expanded memory to be available so you can just add the RAM 1024 options or higher and it will provide some expanded memory here so as you can see here i have now some ems memory available and now the game should start so let's boot up the game and see what we get we select our sound card and then we enter bram stoker's dracula Now there were lots of versions made from Bram Stoker's Dracula. In this case, the MS-DOS version was a first person shooter. So you're basically armed with a pistol and a knife where you wander through various stages. And your goal is to slay all of the unholy creature that you will encounter using your gun or a knife. And then finally try to purify coffins using holy water. And along the way, you can also pick up various items that will help you in your quest. Moving along to the letter C, where we have Cannon Fodder, a game that was ported from the Amiga to MS-DOS in 1993, developed by Sensible Software and published for MS-DOS by Virgin Interactive, with lots of different missions to choose from set in various locations. It's kind of this point and click strategy action shooter filled with a humor. You can basically control a squad of soldiers that can be used to shoot up other soldiers and blow up stuff. It was best game of the year for the Amiga also due to its soundtrack and it's a pretty decent uh, MS-DOS port. I really enjoy playing these types of games and so yeah, kind of reminds me of my old Amiga days. So yeah, pretty nice to see this also available on uh, MS-DOS. Moving on to the letter D, we have a great game from Westwood Studios, and I'm guessing you already know what I'm talking about. Dune, the building of a dynasty. The planet Arrakis, known as Dune. Sand. 
So yeah, I'm guessing June doesn't need any introduction here. It was a strategy game released at the end of 1992, but I did include it in this little compilation. It was very influential for the entire real-time strategy genre, especially also the Command and Conqueror series that Westwood would go on to create uh, after this. Feature stuff like uh, maps, uh, resource gathering, uh, building, uh, different factions, uh, different houses uh, in the Doom realm. So yeah, really awesome uh, real-time strategy game. I still enjoy playing this today. Construction complete. Okay, time for the letter E, and this is going to be a pinball game. I'm guessing you already know what I'm talking about. So this is a game developed by James Schmaltz, published by Epic Games, called Epic Pinball. It was developed by James Schmaltz in nine months while he was in college, and he went on to found Digital Extremes in 1993 that then went on to develop the whole Unreal franchise together with Epic Software. So yeah, cool pinball game for MS-DOS, almost on par with the whole Pinball Fantasies franchise for the Amiga. Time for the letter F and another micro prose gem. A game published by Microprose, but developed by MPS Labs. Let's take a look at the intro for this game. Now I'm guessing that most of you already know what game I'm talking about here. So this is a flight simulator game with both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground combat. It was praised for both its graphics and its flight model and the game was an instant hit. I'm obviously talking about F-15 Strike Eagle 3 from Microprose. Now, as you are sitting in your F-15 cockpit, your goal is to accomplish various air-to-air -air and air-to-ground combat missions. You've got different camera angles of your vehicle. The graphics are really cool. You have lots of different uh, weapons on your F-15. So yeah, really cool game if you're into the whole flight simulator uh, genre. On this particular mission, I wasn't able to come across any bogeys, so I wasn't able to blast them out of the skies, but yeah, really cool game to have on your 486. Next up, we have the letter F, or is it G for Grand Prix? or Formula One Grand Prix, whatever, developed by Microprose. And this is a true classic. It was released for Amiga. It was then later ported to MS-DOS. It's a racing simulation game modeled after the Formula One 1991 calendar. And because it wasn't officially affiliated with the FIA, they got uh, really creative in naming the drivers and the manufacturers so that you could kind of recognize them. But yeah, overall, a real classic. And even till this day, it has an active community and even modern day development tools to create new tracks and stuff like that. Okay, time for the letter H and we have Holiday Lemmings here, an expansion to the original Lemmings game. It's a kind of puzzle strategy game where you need to guide a group of creatures called Lemmings through various obstacles and get them to the exit of the map. Now this is a holiday or Christmas themed 
version of the game with uh, Christmas themed maps uh, created for MS-DOS and yeah really uh, really enjoyable uh, really addictive uh, sometimes frustrating game to play but yeah it's a true uh, classic. Moving to the letter I, and for this one we have Indie Car Racing. I'm Paul Page from Papyrus. This is Indie Car Racing. Now, Indie Car Racing is a realistic racing simulation game uh, from 1993, covering the Indie Car World series. Features stuff like single events, full championship modes, practicing, qualifying races. It was a critically acclaimed game, pretty well received, and was a big commercial success. You can clearly see the influences from the original Indianapolis game that was developed by the same group of developers several years before this one. It's a true simulation game, meaning that you get access to all kinds of metrics from the car, the, the tire temperatures, the fuel gauges, uh, lots of metrics. So yeah, pretty, pretty cool uh, simulation game. And so we've reached the letter J, Jurassic Park. An action game where you control Dr. Alan Grant, a paleontologist who is trapped in Jurassic Park. He needs to fight off the dinosaurs that live there and needs to find the two grandchildren of the park owner. And that turns out to be much easier said than done because the area is vast and the dinosaurs are deadly. So it's up to you to find the grandchildren before you are slayed by the dinosaurs. And let me conclude the first part of this two-part video series with Ken's Labyrinth. A game developed by Ken Silverman himself, the guy who designed the build engine that was used in Duke Nukem 3D in 1996. Now Ken's Labyrinth is a first-person shooter much in the style of Wolfenstein 3D and on the official Ken's Labyrinth page you can still download the latest versions, the source code and the various tools that were used to develop it. All in all a nice little game here that encompasses a lot of gaming uh, history especially given the fact that the guy would go on to build a 3D engine for Duke Nukem 3D. So yeah, that's all I have for part one. I hope you stick around for part two where we will be playing some more games where we will check out that advanced signal processor chip on the Sound Blaster 16. Look at some software which was bundled with this Sound Blaster card. And just continuing having a good time with this nice little 486 setup. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please stick around for part two. If you like this kind of content, please consider giving it a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so, and I hope to see everybody in the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.